Hello, everyone, and welcome to our information session um, on the classroom experience and academic life for fall 2020 at Denison University. I'm Christy Tostevin, uh, Vice President of University Communications, and I'm so excited that you're here with us today. I'm just going to kind of give uh, give you an idea how this next hour will go, and then and then we'll start in. We have a lot of great information to share with you. So we're going to start with some opening remarks from our Provost Kim Copeland, and then we're going to address many pre-submitted questions that we received from you. So thank you so much um, for taking a few minutes out of your day to think about what's on your mind, share it with us so we can make sure we answer those questions. Um, and uh, we received a lot of questions. So it is highly likely that um, we won't even get through all of those. If we do, and we're gonna move quickly, and we're gonna to try to get through everything that we can. If we have time on the end, um, we will open chat up and we uh, will take questions from um, those who are live with us today. Um, and if you have uh, uh, parents or uh, if your student is unable to be watching today and you want them to hear this information, just know like always we're recording it and we will make it available afterward. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to ask our panelists actually to introduce themselves. And I just want to say there are two of our uh, top academic administrators, but I think what is uh, really wonderful about um, academic administrators at Denison is they come from faculty. And both of our panelists today also have experience, extensive experience in the Denison classroom. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about that classroom background. Thanks, Christy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Copeland. I'm the provost of the college. The provost is the chief academic officer, the vice president for academic affairs. Um, as Christy indicated, um, both Kathy and I come to our academic administrative positions from the faculty. I taught in the physics department for about 15 years before I transitioned to the provost office. So I come out of the physics department at Denison. It's interesting that I'm also a Denison graduate from way back in the mid 1980s, and I'm a parent of a Denison graduate. My son Jake just graduated in um, just the spring of 2020. Hi, I'm Kathy Dollard, and I'm the Senior Associate Provost for Academic Affairs. And I have also been in the classroom uh, for, for many years, 21 years in the history department uh, before I joined Kim in academic administration. And in this area of, of academic work, I head up the academic affairs area. So particularly curricular developments is a central piece of what I do and also work with students in special academic circumstances. So happy to join you today. Thank you so much, Kathy and Kim. And Kim, before we get started on q and I'm just gonna ask if you could start us off with some opening remarks, just kind of set the table for us about academic life at Denison fall 2020. Sure, so let me begin by saying that we have just had an increasing number of opportunities to have conversations with faculty over the past, um, past few days, over the past week. And I will just say that everybody is really looking forward to having students back, whether students are coming back to campus in person or whether students are planning to engage the fall semester remotely. We're just excited to get the semester started. I just wanna take a minute or two and just remind you all about our approach to delivering the academic program for the fall semester. Um, we're planning on a hybrid approach. And when I talk about hybrid in this sense, the word hybrid is getting used to describe a lot in the, the higher ed space right now. But specifically what I mean by hybrid is that we have asked faculty to prepare all of their classes with the expectation that some students in those classes will join the class in person, they'll be on campus in person, and some students will be joining the class remotely. We wanted faculty to begin planning for that scenario, and we started this planning back in the late spring and the May-June timeframe. Um, we've encouraged faculty to think about how do they plan for classroom and course experiences that make um, a student experience who's in class, in person, as parallel as possible to a student who's joining the class remotely. So that's been a key feature of our hybrid plan for the academic program for this fall. This hybrid plan also allows for academic continuity for students who may need to be isolated or quarantined and may need to transition to remote learning temporarily. So that's been automatically built into all of the planning for all of our courses. Um, I also want to mention that we've asked faculty to 
think about the workload in their courses and to try to spread that out more evenly over the semester, to be intentional about a more even distribution of work throughout the semester, because we feel that this, this will allow for built-in breakpoints that'll help us accommodate students who need to transition. It'll help us accommodate if a faculty member needs to transition, we'll be just able to provide better course continuity. And just one example of how this might work, if we have a department that has multiple sections of an introductory course, in some cases, those departments are planning to sync up those course sections a little bit more than they might normally do. This will just allow for a faculty member to step in and out if someone becomes ill, just gives a little bit more flexibility. So the key features of our, of our academic plan for the fall are the hybrid approach to the classroom, planning for all classes to incorporate and engage um, both in-person and remote students, and also asking faculty to think about that workload and the distribution of coursework throughout the semester to try to make that a little bit more um, of an even distribution throughout the semester. We'll talk a little bit more um, as we answer your questions, but I do just wanna comment that faculty members are planning a variety of approaches for their courses this fall. Some folks are planning to have primarily in-person courses that meet synchronously that allow for Zoom, um, use Zoom to allow students who are joining remotely. Other faculty members are planning to teach primarily remotely and they're thinking about more of a flipped classroom approach where students may have the opportunity to view a pre-recorded lecture in advance and then come together using the platform of Zoom in small groups to have small group discussions with the faculty members. So we'll talk a little bit more as we answer questions about some of the specific ways that faculty are thinking about the fall. And I wanna end before we, we move to Q&A to just let you know of just something that has really resonated with me is I've had the chance to talk with faculty. As I said, there've been a lot of conversations over the last couple of weeks. I know that faculty are, are, as I said, they're excited to start the semester, but they're really thinking creatively and sharing ideas with one another. And what is so striking is that they're giving themselves permission to let go of how they've always done things in the past. They're recognizing that this is gonna be a different fall semester. And I would say they're embracing the potential and the opportunity provided by this moment. And I hope that you as students, as you're coming back to campus or coming to campus for the first time, will also be able to look at this moment as just a moment of potential and real opportunity as we, as we engage in the fall semester together. So Christy, I'm gonna turn it back to you because I know we've got a number of questions we wanna try to answer. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a really important question right out of the gate. We received multiple questions um, uh, wanting to know about the academic day and will it be extended? Um, and when will students be notified if a time or a location of their class has changed? Sure, Christy, I can speak to that. So this morning students uh, were sent an email from the office, offices of the provost and the registrar. And uh, one of the things we're gonna keep saying again and again is um, communication is key. So students should be checking their Denison email regularly. That was um, a pretty important uh, email this morning that has a lot of information about what the academic uh, year and structures are going to look like. And specifically, we did indicate that yes, um, the academic day is going to be extended. Uh, upper class students know that normally classes begin, with very few exceptions, begin at 8.30 a.m. And normally the academic day, core academic courses um, are finished by 4.30 p.m. We have extended that window from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And in doing so, we really afforded ourselves the opportunity to give students more time to move between classes. We have a lot of health regulations for the ways in which we're going to move students around campus and, and uh, ask them to, to move in buildings. It gives us time to sanitize rooms in between. So there will be 20 minutes between classes instead of the normal 10 minutes. So the academic day will be extended, but the duration of all classes is the same. Everything's tweaked just by five to 10 minutes, uh, basically the start and end times. Um, so while a few students will be starting the day a little bit earlier, um, the, the rhythm of the day will be very similar to how it has been. And um, can I just ask you, Kathy, to um, let students know when they'll know about their schedule if it's been adjusted? Absolutely. So um, also in this morning's email, we shared with students that by August 6th, 
um, your schedule, your revised schedule, revised to uh, this new course grid will be available in um, the campus interface and registration database where you normally check for things. Right now, if you look at it, it's still going to say your typical 9.30 to 10.20 course time. So those changes will all be entered in the course of the next few days. And by August 6th, that will all be available. In the email today as well, we gave students a, a more structured schedule of what's going on with um, the course registration materials, the schedule for adding and dropping classes. Right now you can add and drop classes uh, just like you normally do on the uh, registration database, but after that August 6th period, all ads and drops will go through the office of the registrar. So um, there, there are a few little nuances, but students still have control over their academic schedule. That's terrific. Thank you so much. So uh, Kim mentioned it, but um, Kathy, I'm going to ask you maybe to provide a little more detail on what students can expect with regard to the percentage of classes that would be for the students who are on campus, the percentage of classes that would be fully remote um, or fully in person or a hybrid of the two. Sure. So our faculty have indicated that about 15% will be teaching fully remote. Um, and of course, this is because of faculty managing their own health concerns or um, that, that of people um, with whom they reside, but about 15% will be teaching fully remotely. 60% plan to have some sort of hybrid instruction. As Kim said, hybrid is used in a lot of ways. Hybrid in this way means that a mix of both um, remote and online engagement and in-class on-campus engagement. And then 25% have indicated that uh, they plan to teach in person across the board. Um, we also anticipate that these, these Percentages will fluctuate in, in the next couple of weeks, but students can um, depend upon the fact that there will be some rich engagement in the classroom here at Denison and that, that the significant majority of faculty will be teaching in the classroom. Um, this morning's email also has some detailed information about how students can find out which faculty are remote. So without getting too, too deep into that, go to the registration database and in the attributes area, it will say those faculty, that 15% who are fully remote. Notebold is going to be the best place to find information about hybrid arrangements. And in some cases, if a faculty member has a Tuesday, Thursday class, they might be meeting half the class on Tuesdays, half the class on Thursdays, um, or dividing into cohorts in different ways. We've made sure that any innovation that faculty do in terms of their hybrid approach does not interfere with uh, the, the course schedule of, of um, the other courses in which a student is enrolled. So there, there will be a lot of uh, variety in the approaches that faculty uh, bring. And so we encourage students to really stay close to Notebull. I think you'll see faculty beginning to publish those Notebull pages, making them accessible for students in the next week or so. And it's then in that front page of each class where their course approach will be uh, described. Perfect. Thank you so very much. Um, another question for you, Kathy, if you don't mind, can you talk a little about how class classrooms will be configured? Will there be distance between chairs um, and how will that all be accommodated? Sure. Um, as you might imagine, there's been a lot of work and thought that has gone into classroom space this summer. A lot of tape measures, a, a lot of just good and hard work thinking about how we can refigure, reconfigure classroom capacities. That work and measurement is, is all complete now, and every classroom capacity has been reconfigured so that um, we can ensure that all students are six feet apart from one another and also six feet apart from their instructors. We've also, for the most part, removed all of those chairs from the rooms. And so um, we really are in the last phases of getting the classrooms ready in terms of that, that distancing. So uh, for students who know the campus well, that means that we've had to think about some unusual spaces uh, that we think can be exciting. So some fun spaces where classes will be held that they, in which they normally are not held. Uh, Slater Auditorium, Lampson Lodge, uh, even the Swayze Stage, and classes are going to be held in the Bandersnatch. We also are installing tents on campus this week that will allow for outdoor classroom options if faculty want to choose that. So there is going to be a variety of use of space. 
it's, it's a reality of our present context that some rooms, such as science labs, where there's fixed equipment, um, they may not be able to hold as many people um, as normal. And so in those classes, our science faculty have been hard at work, as have our performing arts faculty, thinking about how to use those types of spaces, um, creating uh, smaller cohorts that will be in the labs at, at different times. Um, in addition to the six feet uh, capacity and distancing that we've addressed in all of the classroom space, there will be safety, safety regulations students can anticipate. Um, masks will be required in all classes. And of course, I think students are aware that we have a, a campus-wide mask policy. And court, classrooms, as I mentioned earlier, will be sanitized between every class session and students will be doing part of that work. It's a, we have a quick sanitizer that really um, disinfects in a matter of minutes. So um, that will be something that student and faculty are partnering with. And then of course, as mentioned, we've extended the day to allow for all of these things and movement to happen. If somebody has a class in Lamson, you have to have time to get uphill to get to the Bandersnatch. So that's another reason for the 20 minute um, difference. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna ask this last question of you, Kim. Can you talk about for students who are fully remote, if classes will be synchronous or asynchronous? Sure, um, that's a good question. And I think the answer is it's gonna depend. Some of your classes will be synchronous. Some of your classes will be asynchronous. And that may be something that flexes and changes throughout the semester. So as Kathy mentioned, we have asked faculty starting today to begin to provide updates to the notebook, um, the notebook page, the notebook section for their course, so that students can get specific information and up to date information about ways that a faculty member plans to uh, approach a course. So, um, and this obviously includes students who are studying remotely. So, my advice to you is, you know, give faculty a few days to get things get things set up in notebook, but then there should be information in notebook from your faculty members about courses and kind of what the plans are. And as I said, those plans will likely flex as we go throughout the semester. So this semester, it's gonna be just incredibly important that students and faculty remain in, in good communication with, with one another throughout the semester. Um, so I, I would anticipate if I was a fully remote student, I would just get in my mindset that, yeah, there are going to be some classes that I'm going to intend, attend in real time, synchronous, synchronously with others, and there are going to be other classes that I'm going to be doing asynchronously. So that's just the mindset I would have now until you are able to get more specific information. Um, Christy, is it okay if I just talk a little bit more generally about different approaches that, that faculty are taking um, for the fall? So as I mentioned um, earlier, so faculty members are just thinking very, very creatively as, as they plan for the fall. And um, a lot of faculty members, I think, will use an approach that's maybe more of a flipped classroom approach where there's the content, the lecture, the video um, is delivered to students in advance of the class. And then I think one of the things that we learned from last spring is that doing small group discussions using the platform of Zoom enables students who are in-person and students who are remote to, to participate. So I, I think there will be a lot of tutorial or small group type discussion sections in a lot of courses. Some faculty members are, as I said earlier, planning on um, meeting classes in person, Zooming remote students in, in real time. Um, other faculty members are um, just going to do, do a mix and they may be breaking classes up into smaller groups of students. And if, if a class meets Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday may be the day for half of the class to come and meet in person. Thursday may be all the remote students are meeting together to, to do the discussion. So I just encourage you all to be in good communication with your faculty members, pay attention to the information they provide in Notebook, and then just be willing to be flexible as the semester goes on. That's terrific. Thank you. While we're on um, just the topic of how classes will be conducted, can you talk a little about what lab experience will be like? Sure. So as a, a laboratory scientist myself, I'm, I'm watching with interest how our laboratory-based classes are, are planning for, for the fall semester. And again, I think there's a range of approaches. So some of the um, some of the ideas that have made their way up to me. I think some faculty are planning on 
assigning lab groups that have a mixture of in-person students and remote students. And the remote students may be the ones who have primary responsibility for actually going into the lab and carrying out the experiment with the remote, sorry, the in-person students would do that. The remote students would be zoomed in to participate in that way. The remote students may have a different kind of responsibility. They may be doing the, the data analysis. They may be taking the lead on beginning to draft the report. So everybody would be involved but people would have different responsibilities depending on how they're attending, attending the lab. Some labs, especially those in psychology, may be done entirely remotely, especially labs that are computer-based. And psychology, I know, has been working closely with, with our information technology department to make sure that they've got all the, the software available to students who are studying remotely. Our chemistry department has a very intensive hands-on laboratory-based curriculum. And our chemistry department late in the spring, early in the summer was really a little bit um, flummoxed about how they were going to allow students to participate in labs if they couldn't get to campus. So what chemistry is gonna do is they recognize that not all of their chemistry students are gonna be able to get to campus to take classes remotely. And so they'll miss out on that hands-on lab experience. So the chemistry department is going to offer a summer skills or a, a boot camp type experience that students can participate in the future when we're able to get back on campus, just focused on those hands-on bench laboratory skills. Um, some departments, including chemistry and physics, are planning to do lab work with general household items. So things that you could just come up with at your house. So no need for special lab equipment that might be most appropriate for an introductory level lab. And then I just heard um, in a session earlier today with faculty from one of our biology professors who said he's given himself permission to say, I'm not going to worry about how I've always taught this course in the past. I'm going to think differently. I'm going to recognize that there's a lot to being a research scientist. There's a lot of um, laboratory in-person skills, but there's also a lot of research and um, proposal writing skills that he's going to have a different kind of focus for the laboratory section of his class that will back away from being so focused on the actual in-person in the lab experience. So a lot of creativity um, coming out of our, our laboratory scientists as they prepare for the fall. That's really exciting. Thank you, Kim. On that same note, can you talk about performing arts classes? Will they happen? And if so, how? Yeah, performing arts classes are, are definitely going to happen. And again, this is another um, type of course that's maybe you have to think differently about how to transition from an in-person to a hybrid format where you've got some students in person, some students remote, and then you also have to build in all of the social distancing, physical distancing requirements. So. Um, you know, musical ensembles are, are going to happen. A lot of them may rehearse in smaller groups. They may rehearse outside. So I know our music faculty are thinking really, really carefully. Music lessons, I think private lessons are going to be available, of course, to in-person and remote students. I think our private lesson faculty had some really good experiences working with students remotely last spring, and they, they've learned a lot and are building on the experience they had in the spring. Again, we'll use outdoor spaces. We're planning for tents on the Fine Arts Quad near the Eisner Center. So that will be a key piece of, of helping facilitate some, some lessons in music. Those of you who have been on campus and know the Eisner Center know that we've got, might know that we've got a pretty advanced recording system in Eisner. So we're, we're working on how can we use that recording system in Eisner to have students who are physically located in different rooms but actually simultaneously playing together using the recording system. And this system is advanced enough that you don't have the, the lag problems that you might have with other um, less advanced recording systems. One of the things that was really fun to hear about came from our theater department as they were planning their fall production season. They, they have two productions planned. One of them is gonna be staged entirely outside and one of them is going to be staged entirely remotely. This is actually an area, this remote virtual performance is actually an area that one of our faculty members works in. So um, students in dance classes, they're thinking about, like Kathy mentioned, sometimes you just can't, in a science lab, you can't get as many students in because of physical distancing. So dance classes are thinking about how do they group students in smaller bring students together in smaller groups. Um, I know that the dance faculty members are also planning to do um, some work outside as well. And then just, this isn't a performing arts, but just so people know that also our 
faculty in the studio art program, again, it's, it's this use of outdoor space. There's gonna be a tent located fairly close to the Bryant Art Center so that some students can be actually working in the studio, but other students who don't have to be in the studio at a particular time to work on a project, maybe working with a faculty member outside. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Kathy, um, I'm gonna to come to you for the next question. Um, can you talk about what will happen if a student has to be in isolation because um, they have a confirmed case of COVID-19 or in quarantine because they have been in contact with somebody who does and if they'll be able to continue their studies? Um, this is really one of the, the central questions I think that our, our teams of faculty looked at in May when we really buckled down and thought about different models of instruction for the fall. And it's, it's one of the key reasons why we committed to this hybrid model. We recognize that students' experiences in this, in this uh, pandemic context are going to be varied. So all faculty have designed all courses, as we've been emphasizing, to instruct both remote and in-person students. That also means that if a student's status changes, that they begin the, camp the, the semester on campus, uh, but end up in isolation or quarantine, that the faculty member will be able to work with them and move them into that remote element uh, remote component of the course uh, with some fluidity. Uh, faculty members will know uh, the student status uh, that will be updated every evening. So um, while we emphasize that students need to be in touch with their communication, they should also feel reassured that uh, the faculty roster will indicate if a student is in isolation or quarantine. And so they'll know that there has been a change in status and that some outreach in terms of um, helping the student move forward in the course uh, will be uh, important. Great, thank you. Can you also talk about what would happen if a student is ill, any, has any kind of illness and can't actually participate in classes remotely? So this is something that um, we deal with in, in the, the best of circumstances. In the non-pandemic context, there are times when a student's health situation does not support continuing with academic work. Um, it's, it, as I say, it happens in non-pandemic times, so it's certainly reasonable to expect that it will happen in our current context. So that flexibility we keep talking about is important here. We also have some enduring structures that, uh, that we will be ready to um, work with students in looking at if they um, find themselves in that situation. So students may file uh, for incompletes in their courses. This is a standing policy, but I think the way that we've structured the hybrid semester really is going to make um, filing for an incomplete and, and more importantly for the student completing that incomplete it's going to make it more accessible. Um, sometimes we find in a, in a normal semester that uh, so much work is backloaded towards the end of the semester. The biggest projects are all you know, coming, coming uh, to the fore at the same time and taking an incomplete can be very daunting. Um, the way that we've asked faculty to structure the academic work more evenly might make incompletes um, in at least some courses or more than uh, across the board is also a possibility. It would make that more manageable. There are situations though in which a student um, is not in a position to even envision completing the work at a later time. And we have a, a clear medical leave of absence policy. I partner with the Dean of Students in working with students and um, really guiding them through the medical leave of absence. And so there is a lot of um, direct engagement, I think, from our office and the Office of Student Development to help students who would be in that sort of situation. Thank you. Um, if we've talked a lot about students being fully uh, remote or fully on campus, and I wonder um, what about the student who comes to campus and then for whatever reason decides that they would prefer to be remote, is that a possibility? Yes, so the possibility to go remote in any class is available to all students if they feel the need to leave campus. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that's something that will be clear on the faculty members roster. In that sort of a case, if a student is making the decision to, to leave campus, there will be, um, it will be very important for them to really engage with their faculty members, even though the administrative structure is in place for the faculty to know about the student's situation. Um, shifting to fully remote will, will be a place where the faculty member and the student should work together um, and just talk 
about that transition. Some of the assignments might be slightly different. Some group work might be slightly different, but the curriculum is designed in such a way that it will support that sort of choice. But as we've emphasized this semester, really more than ever, keeping faculty informed will be very important. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit also, Kathy, just about um, office hours? And will there be opportunities for in-person office hours, professors meeting, um, you know, if classes are designated to go remote only, would they still be able to meet with faculty? Absolutely. So accessibility to faculty is really just a central element of a Denison education. And uh, we expect uh, Denison faculty and, and uh, they are happy to, to really be available and accessible to students. So office hours in the, the sort of figurative sense will certainly exist. In the literal sense of going to a faculty member's office, that is significantly less likely uh, this semester because of uh, space restrictions and uh, not um, not many faculty offices can can support having more than one student in at a time you know faculty are also can be pack rats there's lots of stuff in faculty offices so we're not so sure that literal faculty offices in their traditional spaces is what faculty will be doing we think it's very likely that faculty will do a variety of things and this will be something they communicate first day of classes will be communicated in notebook. Some faculty will have office hours outdoors as, as much as they, as long as they possibly can, as long as the weather will support it. Others will have um, a clear uh, way for students to sign up for virtual office hours. Um, there might be group conferences and faculty members will utilize all sorts of technologies to get students to sign up, you know, via Google Calendar or Doodle Polls to find out the best times for either individual students or groups to meet with faculty members. So um, students should feel assured that faculty will be accessible in that way, but we also are really emphasizing to faculty that they're going to have to make clear to students the pathway to kind of, to make that all work. It's going to be um, differentiated in different contexts and faculty will be communicating to students about how that will happen. And similarly, if, if um, all students were to be remote, um, that expectation for uh, virtual office hours would still stand. Terrific, thank you. Um, what about if students are on campus, but they don't feel like it or prefer to, to just participate in classes remotely, is that an option? And I guess I would ask, let me add to that, could a st student just choose to come back to campus and decide that they just wanna take classes all remotely but be on campus doing it? Yeah, Christy, that's a, that's a good question. It's an important one. And I think it's important that we're just, you know, really candid about our expectation. You know, bottom line is if a student is choosing to come back to campus, that's a signal that that student wants to and is planning on attending classes in person, you know, the classes that are available in person. I just think we've all got to understand that we're, we're giving students the option to be remote, but, or the option to return to campus, but those don't necessarily get combined. So um, if a student does return to campus, does take that option, our, our default expectation is that the student's going to be attending the in-person class activities as they normally would. Faculty members will be thinking about attendance. Um, faculty members are gonna know which students are on campus and which students are away from campus. Um, so I think that's, that's just important and I'm just answering it as candidly and as bluntly as possible that just not feeling like attending class in person is not a good reason to just open up your computer and decide you're gonna take class that day from your dorm room. With that said, I do wanna point out that we do understand that some students may be on campus and may need to be isolated or quarantined because of, of coronavirus um, or because of being ill. And if you're well enough and are in um, quarantine, if you're in quarantine or if you're well enough and still in isolation and are able to attend classes remotely, then yes, that's built into the plan. But again, we'll be, we'll be noting that for instructors on, on their class rosters. So bottom line is if you're, if you're coming back to campus, if you're making that signal that I wanna come back and be part of the campus community, our baseline expectation is that you're gonna attend classes in person, those classes that are available to you in person. As with any other situation, if there's a, a, a reason for you to do a class remotely, I would encourage you to be in, in contact with your instructor and say, you know, for 
this day I need to be doing this. I'm going to be able to attend class remotely, not in person. Have that conversation with your faculty member. But you should not plan to be on campus and have attending classes remotely be your primary mode of class attendance. Thank you, Kevin. Can you also provide an update on freshman advising circles? Um, you know, when do freshmen get their assignment for advisors? When will they get to meet their advisors? Yeah, so this is a good question. And when I saw it, I actually reached out to Mark Moeller, who's our Dean of First Year Students and who's responsible for um, first year advising, putting students into advising circles. So I checked with Mark this morning and according to Mark's plan, um, we attend to notify students about advising circles, about which advising circles they're in early next week. And the reason that this is maybe seeming to take a little bit longer is we're trying to enroll students in advising circles based on their choice of topics, but also based on their fall learning situation. Are they gonna be remote or on campus? If a student is remote, what time zone are they in? So we're trying to get as much information as possible from students, from faculty, before we, we finalize the advising circle um, course rosters and which advising circles students will be in. So hopefully that notification will go to students who have opted to enroll in an advising circle by early next week. Um, I also want to, Christy, can I just mention, um, I, I know there's also a question for students who are not in advising circles when they're going to be notified about their advisor. This is um, information that Mark gave me as well. He's planning to complete all first year advising assignments prior to first year move in day and students will get this information from the first year office about how to under how to learn who their advisor is. If you're in an advising circle, your instructor will reach out to you with details about that first advising circle meeting. Students who are not in an advising circle, um, in that case, your advisor will reach out to you to set up another per to set up a meeting that's either going to happen, as Kathy said, it might be in person, it might be virtually. It's incredibly, incredibly important, and Kathy and I can't stress this enough that students are responsive to faculty advisors who reach out um, regarding a meeting. So especially if you're not in an advising circle and your advisor reaches out to you, make sure you respond, make sure you follow up, um, make sure you get in touch with your faculty advisor, a really, really important person um, for, for you to get to know. Thank you, um, Kathy, I have just a few questions actually for you regarding um, course material. So how students find out about the books and other material that they are going to need, uh, will they be able to get them from the bookstore? And for international students, um, how will they make book orders? How will they, you know, receive course material? Sure. So at this uh, point, and this is about where I'd say we are in, in any semester, about 50% of the courses have submitted book orders. Uh, faculty are still finalizing syllabi, something that some of that has been a little bit more fluid as they um, uh, begin to learn the proportion of their students um, and how they might design some assignments. Uh, those uh, book lists are available on the bookstore website. I also say that 50%, that total is increasing daily. At the same time, um, some faculty won't use books. Uh, some will rely on article databases out of our library and other online materials. So a student should not be alarmed if there are not books listed for a course. Um, there's, there's a great deal of variety in the types of resources that faculty use in their courses. Um, for international students, um, oh, and I should add, the bookstore will be um, open for students to purchase books um, when they arrive to campus, and there will also be um, spacing regulations and, and limitations in that. So their students can both uh, look in advance and also can purchase books when they arrive on campus. Uh, the reopen website has particular information regarding international student book orders and the bookstore is not in a position to ship packages internationally they can do so domestically but cannot do so internationally um, as many countries are not uh, dependably accepting mail or packages in in the current context so instead the bookstore is working to find digital sources for all materials and um, there is a service that they're they're utilizing to do that and we anticipate that international students, by and large, will be able to download all of those books that faculty um, are electing to use in their courses. Thank you, Kathy. Switching gears a little bit, can you talk about study abroad and what year or years are students eligible for study abroad programs? Sure. Um, Denison students, uh, 
who study abroad um, most frequently do so uh, in their junior year, overwhelmingly do so in their junior year. And the first step uh, to that path to study abroad is to reach out to our Office of Off-Campus Study in your sophomore year. Um, certainly, you can begin to uh, to do that work and just explore programs prior to that, but the actual process of applying for study abroad occurs during the fall semester of the sophomore year. There's a, a structured application process and a, a really uh, good team there that helps students think about um, how to negotiate the, the variety of opportunities that are out there for study away. Um, the office has strong relationships with our off-campus providers. As you can imagine, this is an area of a lot of um, in a lot of flux right now. Um, most off-campus providers are not offering study away, uh, for example, for fall of 20, but um, they're, they're closely in touch with the various providers that we use and have a good sense of how programs are evolving and developing options in the pandemic context. Denison does not have any particular sister school. Um, we don't sponsor independently our own off-campus programs. Rather, we partner with more than 100 highly vetted programs and our Office of OCS maintains those strong relationships. Another question regarding study abroad. If we currently have students right now who are scheduled to study abroad in the spring, if those programs are canceled, especially if they're canceled last minute, what will happen with those students and the, their, they will obviously need then to, to uh, sign up for classes on campus or remotely, will they kind of be stuck with what's left over? What will be their options there? We were very happy that we did this in the spring, given um, how fall 20 has evolved, and we will do this again um, this fall. The students who are anticipating studying away in the next semester, so those students who are scheduled to go abroad in spring 21, will register for classes this fall um, as a backup plan, and they will register in their normal, uh, the normal process of things. So they'll register with the full junior class. They won't be penalized in any way. Um, they'll just register for classes. And in the eventuality that um, off-campus study is a possibility in the spring, then um, they'll simply withdraw from those, those classes and those spots will be open to other students. It's, it's hard to say right now with off-campus study in the spring. Um, certainly off -camp our, our off-campus study office is moving forward as if programs will be a go and we're going to learn a lot about the global situation that, that changes every day. Um, and that office will be in good touch with those students who are already scheduled for particular programs as things evolve. Terrific, thank you. Kim, can I ask you to talk about the Knowlton Center and will it be open and available to students in the fall? Yeah, good question. And I hope that all students know about the Knowlton Center or Knowlton Center for Career Exploration, a really important um, part of the college for students to know and to engage with. So yes, the Knowlton Center will be open. It will be um, open. There will be staff in the center. Not a, It won't be fully staffed in person, but there will be staff in the office in person for drop-ins, quick questions that students want to stop by and ask. Their primary mode of interacting with students for one-on-one -on -one appointments, for career exploration programming, things like resume workshops, employer information sessions, those at the moment are planned to be done um, primarily in a remote or virtual format. Hank Malin, our director of the Knowlton Center says, we're gonna assess this model every two to three weeks to see how it's working. He's also in touch with career centers across our, our peer institutions to make sure that uh, what we're planning to do is, you know, seems to be consistent with what with what others are doing. Um, what they learned last spring is that students were very comfortable with remote appointments. So again, I think the Knowlton Center is building on and using our experience last spring. And I think all of us know that as we think about the world of work and remote engagement, that's going to be incredibly and important as, as we go forward. Um, Hank also pointed out that holding virtual employer sessions actually allows us to engage a larger number of, of possible employers, of employers who come in to, to talk about Denison students because it doesn't require traveling to Granville. So that's important. 
Also want to point out to those of you who are seniors, um, class of 2021 graduates that expect very, very early engagement from the Knowlton Center. Um, they realize that a lot of a lot of up rising seniors haven't had the same opportunities for internships because of the way things evolved this summer. So the Knowlton Center is aware of that. They've got a lot of front loaded employer information sessions and programming early in the fall because they really want to help seniors get those job searches launched, get those grad school searches underway. So um, expect early engagement, look for early opportunities to engage with the Knowlton Center. For those of you who are first years, look for the Knowlton Center at AUGO sessions. Um, you'll, you might see them in advising circles at various AUGO sessions. Knowlton Center is also gonna partner with, with faculty and coaches for engagement with classes and students. So lots of normal Knowlton Center business. The office will be staffed and open, but a lot of activities will be done remotely. And they are sensitive to remote students who are in different time zones. And so they're planning, like faculty office hours, they're, they're planning also to be um, aware of students who are in different time zones and they'll do some things, they'll have some off hours appointments, so to speak. So to accommodate students who might be in, um, in California, in Asia, who just can't easily make an 8.30 a.m. meeting Ohio time. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kim. Another question for you. And what provisions are being made for faculty or staff who might fall ill for a period of time and how will that affect you know, the, the campus life, the classroom. Yeah, so we have made some adjustments to just some of our basic employment policies. I won't go into that detail here, but we certainly do recognize that members of our campus community, faculty and staff, um, you know, are susceptible to becoming ill. And so we've tried to make sure that we've addressed that on the front end with some, some updates to our employment policies. In terms of faculty members and thinking about courses, as we talked about earlier, one of the um, ways that we wanted faculty to think about their courses was to have this in mind that what if I need to step away from the course for a short period of time? Can I do some advanced planning that makes it easy for somebody else from my department to step in? Or maybe there's a unit where students are working you know, for a week really independently. So we're asking faculty to do some of that work in advance to distribute work more evenly, to work with colleagues in the departments as they're planning courses that are similar so that they can, they can carry the load for one another. And this would be normal for us. If a faculty member becomes ill during a semester, which as Kathy said, that can happen in the best of circumstances, we have departments where they're just used to stepping up and, and covering things if a faculty member needs to be out of the classroom for a short period of time. In a situation that's more extreme, if we find out next week that a faculty member is not gonna be able to cover a class, in those cases, we might have to look to do some, some hiring for the short term, but primarily these would be covered on a department by department basis. That's terrific. Uh, we got a lot of questions regarding the percentage of students who will be remote, um, fully remote versus on campus. Can you provide an update on where we are with those numbers? Sure, and as, as Kathy would know, um, these are very, very fluid numbers. Kathy's kind of on the front lines working with, with, with students who are planning to study remotely. But at this time, I would say that the vast majority of students are planning to return to campus. At this moment, and again, it's a very fluid and evolving number, we have about 285 students who are planning to study remotely off campus. So about 285 of our roughly 22, 2300 students. That's terrific, thank you. I wanna mention that I think we will have a few minutes left at the end um, to take questions from those who are watching live right now. So we have turned on the comment feature on YouTube. So if you have a question, please put it there and we will, uh, we will try to answer it before we close. Um, we do have a couple of pre-submitted questions to get through, but I think we might have some time. Um, so um, one of the questions that we've gotten is looking ahead, and this is really super exciting. Um, do we have any idea what the academic calendar will be for spring and when uh, we expect classes to resume for, for spring semester? Yeah, great question. If anybody has a firm answer, let me know. As Adam, as President Weinberg would say, this is where a crystal ball would come in handy. So the simple answer is we simply don't know at this point. If you look at the academic calendar for this year that's posted on the website, the start date for the spring is listed as January 18th. 
but we honestly just don't know if that's even a realistic start date. We're gonna have to look more carefully at this as we get into the fall. And earlier in a session with faculty this week, we were asked this very same question because faculty are obviously anxious about it as well. And I think that President Weinberg really expects that as we get into September and October, we'll be able to really confirm much more about the start of the spring semester and the spring semester calendar in that se September to October timeframe. We know it's a question um, students wanna know, faculty want, wanna know, parents wanna know. So we'll, we'll work on that as soon as we can. We just wanna wait to have more real-time information before we set a concrete plan in place for the spring. I'm gonna ask a question. Actually, I'm gonna go back to the last one we talked about. And I just, I, uh, with regard to being remote and how many, students are remote versus on campus. Kim, is it still possible for a student to make a decision to be remote? And what is there a deadline for when they would have to make that decision? Yeah, so for a student who is still weighing that decision, and I'm gonna let Kathy jump in and just, just correct me because she's got more, um, more of the right people to contact. But if a student is still weighing that decision, I think, what I would encourage you to do is to reach out to, and this is where I'm going to have Kathy confirm this, to Bill Fox, to Kathy Dollard. So yes, we recognize that plans are still evolving for students and plans are still changing. So we want to have the student get in contact with the right person at Denison. And Kathy, I'll let you just confirm that. Sure. Um, of course, we want, we want to hear your plans, uh, the sooner the better, so that, that faculty can plan, so that housing can plan. But we also recognize that um, news is changing and decision making is changing. Uh, at this time, I would still encourage students to go to the reopen website and this I think this is maybe the first or second question on the academics page. Uh, what if I want to study remotely and that will take you to a form and that form is monitored every day um, by our Dean of Students and his team, and one of them will get back to you uh, very soon and and pull your in, you'll, you'll submit some information on the form and then they will be in touch with you to discuss um, approval for remote status. Um, it's just a, a moment for engagement with the college so that um, you have an opportunity to have a conversation before that, that is finalized. Um, I think as there will be a certain point in time where that, that form is uh, not as useful uh, when we get to a few days before classes, but we're not there yet. And um, I think if, if we do uh, have another route, we would post that on the reopen website or otherwise uh, tell students in, in some clear communication. But right now, I think um, using that form and uh, be assured that there's a, a team of, of people who are addressing these. And yes, uh, like a week ago, it was not 285. Those numbers are still um, coming in as students decide about remote status. Terrific. I'm going to ask this of Kim or Kathy, whoever can answer it. This one just came in. Um, uh, through the comment section on YouTube. Will midterms be around the same time as usual or will they be pushed back uh, in any way or adjusted in any other way? I can dive in. I, I see Kim's mute, that mic is still off, but uh, Kim, please, please uh, uh, follow up. Um, midterms will be at the same pacing, right? So we have a 14 week semester and faculty normally schedule midterms and, and recognize that not all classes have a traditional midterm, that's up to the instructor. Um, but, but if there is a midterm event or exam, it, students should expect that it will be around week seven or week eight, which is traditionally when it happens. However, I wanna to return to that point we made earlier that we really encourage faculty to spread academic work more evenly throughout the semester. Um, so they're likely are going to be more assessments earlier in courses. Um, and uh, so the midterms might not be as, as heavy weight as they normally are. Um, we also are talking with faculty about these natural breaks in the semester that um, there are moments because there isn't a fall break as folks know um, that there might be a, a space towards the middle of the semester where we try as a community to have a little bit less academic work assigned. That's, you know, classes have their own rhythms, but that's something that we're talking to faculty about and um, it is a possibility. Thank you, that's very helpful. And I actually, this next question I'm gonna throw out to you, I'm not sure if either of you can answer it or if it's something we'll have to um, get back and provide the answer on the reopen website. But if students who were um, scheduled to study abroad um, in the spring and those get canceled, do they have the opportunity to do study abroad programs in the fall of their senior year? 
Yeah, Kathy, I'll, I'll answer this and then you can certainly chime in um, due to your close work with, with Katie crossley Froelich and the, the study abroad office. So um, primary importance here is to make sure that if you're a student planning to study abroad in the spring, make sure you're in good communication with, with Katie crossley Froelich and her, and her staff in the global programs office. Um, it may depend if, if you want to do a specific program, it may be program specific. Um, students certainly are able to study abroad in their senior year. That's not our most common study abroad time, but it is a possible study abroad time. And, but it's important for you to be in good communication with Katie and her office so you know about different options for your particular program or other programs. It's also really important for you to be in good communication with your academic advisor as you think about your academic program and implications of being away the fall of your senior year versus the spring of your, of your junior year. So those would be, be my thoughts. Kathy, do you wanna add anything? I think that's right. I would also encourage, uh, it, it's uh, my office in partnership with the registrar that looks at academic requirements for graduation. And uh, if, if that's something that you're thinking about in some majors, depending on what's available, you'll, you'll really need to think through and work with the department as to um, meeting all major requirements. But the Office of OCS, as Kim said, will partner with students to, to look at what might be possible. Great. Um, this next question, Kim, I'm gonna ask you to channel your uh, inner Alexander Shimmer, who is the head of our, our reopen task force team, um, who usually answers this question, but is there a single event that would trigger us to you know, shut down campus and, and have students return home? And if so, are there plans in place to avoid it being as sudden you know, as it happened in the spring? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. And again, this is a question that we're getting asked by faculty members as well who remember the spring and um, you know don't necessarily want to be in that place again. So the first thing I will say is that we are in a very, very, very different place now at Denison in, in terms of our understanding of coronavirus, in terms of our planning for you know, trying to prevent an outbreak, what we would do to contain an outbreak, everything that we're doing to try to mitigate risk. So while it certainly could be likely that the state of Ohio, that the governor, um, you know, directs all colleges to, to go remote, which is what happened in the spring, we want to be prepared and recognize that that could happen. I do think that our plan, which has been developed in close conversation with um, the, the chancellor of higher education in the state of Ohio with the governor's office, that we would take a variety, a series of steps before we would send students home. And I think the most likely scenario might be that in some cases we may have to quarantine a residence hall if we think there's a potential outbreak in a residence hall. We may have to ask everybody on campus, all students may go remote from your dorm rooms, from your residence hall rooms for a couple weeks. Um, so I think we have a number of steps that we would put in place. We want to keep students who are on campus on campus before we would have a, a situation similar to what we had in the spring where everybody had to leave suddenly. So I don't envision that happening again, but Again, I don't have a crystal ball to be able to predict exactly what's going to happen. So I don't want to say it would never happen, but that's certainly not what we're, we're expecting. Okay, thank you so much, Kim. I'm going to take one more question that was just submitted, and then I have one final one of my own that I want to get in. Um, so uh, is there a, a deadline, and what is that deadline if a student actually decides to withdraw for the semester or the year um, uh, uh, versus studying remotely or being on campus? I can dive in with that. Um, a student may withdraw, certainly a student may withdraw from the institution at any time. Uh, the, the difference um, in terms of, of timing is where uh, we are in terms of the semester. Um, so for financial aid reasons and a variety of reasons, um, if a student starts at a certain date, uh, there are only, it, it is, it behooves them, and I wish the Dean of Students were here to talk about it more precisely, but um, 
if you start the semester and you decide you want to withdraw, you should withdraw quickly because it changes the ways in which financial aid, federal financial aid views um, your use of that semester as one of your semesters of eligibility. Um, and I don't have the particulars on that, but um, our Office of Financial Aid and the Dean of Students can provide more specific information on that. If a student is thinking of withdrawing, then I, I suggest also going to that same form actually I talked about earlier on the reopen. Um, it certainly asks if students are planning on being remote, but it also uh, gives the option of providing further information. And our team, um, but both uh, in on academics, off campus study, international student services, and in student development, are talking with students um, about the sorts of options they're considering and what might make the sense for each individual at a given moment in time. Uh, we have a couple of programs that um, are not full withdrawals from the college. We have an educational enrichment leave, and that's something that is fairly unusual. But um, if, if you're interested in a different sort of experience, that's something that is on the website. Um, and, and it's, again, not something that is often pursued, but perhaps an op option for those students uh, thinking about not being here in, this, in the fall. Thank you so much. And I, I took us a little too close to time, but I'm getting my last question in anyway, if, if people can stay with us for another few minutes. I just wanna know um, both Kim and Kathy, maybe starting with you, Kim, what is your final kind of advice um, for students studying remotely and how they might make the most of it? And then I'll ask the same question for students who might be studying on, on campus. Yeah, Christy, that's such a good question. And I'm just going to start by, you know, kind of putting my faculty hat on and remembering my days as a faculty member. And, and I haven't experienced life as a faculty member in this remote and hybrid format. But what is true about Denison faculty members is that they want to get to know students. And so if you're a student who's studying remotely, I just encourage you to take advantage of every opportunity, every platform, every connection you can use to get to know your faculty members, get to know your professors, reach out to them. Don't use that remote experience as, as kind of a barrier or a wall. And I realize that for some of us, it, it's challenging to be in this remote environment. But I do think as um, our faculty members have gotten more experience working with students remotely, they've, they've figured out lots of creative ways to stay connected, to get to know students. So that would be my my biggest piece of advice, if you're studying remotely or if you're studying on campus, is recognize your faculty members want to get to know you. They want to support you. They want to help you. They want to challenge you. Um, they want to do all, all the things that are so true about Dennis, and they want to develop relationships with their students. So don't miss those opportunities and look for those opportunities, especially if you're studying remotely and not on campus. I would just add to that, um, Christy. I think I, we've talked a lot about accessibility both ways, that faculty uh, are going to be accessible to students. It's so important that students stay in good touch with their faculty, whether on campus, whether on campus in quarantine or whether studying remotely. And uh, we can't emphasize that enough. We, we have the resources like Note Bowl and, and other technological resources that help to, to make those um, threads of engagement uh, really uh, work together well, but it's something that students are, are going to, to um, more than ever need to take, um, be aware of and take initiative of. I think another um, reflection I have, um, Kim talked about our faculty and putting the faculty hat on as well. Um, I was talking to a colleague who is a very traditional in the classroom. It needs a chalkboard, needs books, needs a table, and um, works with his students in that way. Um, has a number of remote students, uh, fully remote students in um, his classes this semester and has been working hand in hand with educational technology services to think of innovative ways to bring together those students who are remote and those are, who will be in the classroom and uh, is, is really excited about the new technologies. Hey, look, Noble can do this. Well, some of us knew Noble could do lots of stuff for a while, but I think there's a period of discovery going on for some of our faculty members that's really exciting. And so even though this time is not ideal in so many ways, and I think we all grapple with that in our own ways, it's also a, a great laboratory uh, for collaboration and experimentation. And I think our faculty are very excited to partner with our students in that. Thank you so much, Tim and Kathy. Thank you everyone for being with us today.
Thank you for sticking with us for a few extra minutes. I think those were really important uh, words of advice uh, and I didn't want you to miss out on them. I will remind you that um, please continue to pay attention to your email boxes for our weekly um, student and family newsletter that comes out on Fridays. Um, I also will encourage you to continue using the reopen website. It's reopen.denison.edu. Lots of great information there. And of course, our email address, if you have additional questions that didn't get answered, reopen at denison.edu. And uh, we look forward to talking with you again soon. We hope you'll, we'll jo you'll join us tomorrow for a session on health and wellness and next week for a session on Wednesday on um, social life on campus. Thank you. <laughs>